Can you hear me? There? Okay. Okay, uh, this lecture will be very pedagogical. I mean, I'll try to be very, very simple, trying to focus on some of the concepts I introduced uh, my first lecture on Monday. Uh, the main issues I would like to discuss are the quantum to classical mapping. or classical to quantum mapping, I mean, the scaling limit, and the concept of scaling limit, which uh, leads to universality, okay? These are the main uh, issues. In order to discuss them, I would like to do that in a very simple model. Um, just to avoid uh, technicalities. So uh, the model I, cho I chose was is, um, the easy model in one dimension, classical easy model in one dimension, which can be easily solved mm, very simply. And of course the, the quantum version, which is just one quantum spin. Okay, so this is uh, the, the model. Uh, so I would like to show you that uh, if we consider um, a classical model, a statistical model, so we write down the partition function of uh, a classical Hamiltonian summing over the, 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 um, the spins, I mean considering for a simple lattice model which is just a chain, classical chain, on each side I put a variable as i which takes value minus one and one. Very simple. Okay. I think that we have already seen this model. So I would like to discuss these features, these issues on this simple model. And then here you can also write down uh, you can put a temperature uh, for simplicity, I mean uh, I will put it beta one. No, in a way, I include the temperature in the couplings of the of the model, and the model I'm considering the Hamiltonian, the classical Hamiltonian, is a simple Hamiltonian um, for a chain, which is this one here. We can put a coupling k, okay, which uh, if you want include also the temperature, and uh, we may also add. Uh, a kind of magnetic field coupled to the spin, and here we have S, S i. Okay, this model, we, we put this model, um, we consider periodic boundary conditions. So, this is a chain, we have uh, m spins, and the condition as such that S1, S0, S1 is equal to, if you want, uh, m plus 1. Okay, you can see it as a model, a lattice model on a ring. Uh, okay, so just a ring if you want. Okay, this is uh, the one dimension is a model which can be easily solved as we will see in a few minutes. And I, want I would like to show that this is equivalent, I mean, and this is the, the quantum, the classical to quantum mapping, to a partition function for a quantum model, simple quantum model, which is can be written this way, where here we have a quantum Hamiltonian for just one spin, and this quantum Hamiltonian is just uh, is written in terms of Pauli matrices. So we have, um, uh, for example, sigma z minus sigma x. Okay. I want to show you, I will show you with simple calculation that there is this mapping. Okay. This mapping holds in a particular limit we will consider, uh, which is the scaling limit. It's okay, that's uh, the main point. Now, uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the easiest way of uh, 
from the pedagogical point of view of discussing uh, this uh, paradigm, which are very important for critical phenomena in quantum and thermal transitions, is to consider a simple model, solving it, and see, taking the, the limits, everything can be done analytically, okay? I won't do, probably I won't do all the uh, all the calculation, but I leave them to you as exercise. Uh, we will see. Okay, that's uh, the main point of uh, at least the first part of this lecture. So since the blackboard is quite is finite, I mean I have to cancel. <laughs> Let me know if you can read it uh, because I see that uh, it's not complete. It's not clear because there is. Uh, background of this blackboard. <laughs> so let me start from the classical easy model. Classical easy change. So let's take the Hamiltonian. This is a classical Hamiltonian. I wrote it in this way. Minus k sum of s e s e plus 1 minus h sum over s i and uh, the sum is done over the sites we have m sites okay number of sites is finite okay we want to compute the partition function from the partition function we get all the the thermodynamic of this and this uh, is defined by summing over the states let me set beta equal to 1 okay that's a uh, this can be done. In, in a way, beta is included in these couplings here. Okay? Now, this z can be easily written in terms of, okay, this one here can be written as uh, sum of s i. Since we have here an exponential, this can be written as a product of matrices of uh, function at the moment, if you want. This is quite clear, okay? They are function. In a sense, this T1 is just the exponential. Minus K SI, SI plus 1. And T2 is just the exponential of this second term. Okay? Now, let me introduce what's called the transfer matrix. In this case, can be written exactly introduce we introduce this function this uh, matrix here k e to minus k e to minus k k okay this is just a definition if you want at the moment but i can show you that uh, can enter the calculations and another one which is uh, e to the h e to the minus h this is diagonal okay now, you can easily see okay, that this expression here can be written as uh, um, a trace over T1, T2 to the M. Okay. This is a simple exercise. I suggest you to do by yourself. Okay. There we have a definition. Okay. And this is, uh, or if you want, in order to simplify a little bit the calculation, it's useful to rewrite this in this form, okay, using the properties of the trace. Now, we have to compute this trace, you want to compute the partition function, okay, the idea is to diagonalize this matrix this one and this can be easily done this two by two matrix this can be easily done and uh, by simple calculation one obtains this uh, two eigenvalues epsilon one two which uh, can be easily computed S should be something like this cosine hyperbolic cosine plus minus e to this 2k 
sine h square plus 2k the square root of this okay this is a very simple exercise it's a diagonalization of a two matrix matrix so this two okay t1 t1 times t2 or that combination to make it simple okay now we have uh, the eigenvalue since we have the eigenvalue of this matrix the solution of uh, i mean uh, this uh, this trace here can be is written as a we have to take the the we have to take the the trace and this is just the solution so everything is done analytically very simple i suggest you again to do all calculation but they are very simple okay then if you want to compute the free energy hmm, the free energy is obtained by taking the logarithm of the partition function okay and uh, one may replace this expression here into a z and obtain the free energy okay for the free energy one obtains uh, most of the properties of our system simple system another important point is the two point function if you want to come usually we compute correlation function correlation function are not encoded in the free energy i mean we must do something else and uh, let me May I suggest to the organizers a larger blackboard? <laughs> <laughs> so you have written all these things, I hope, so uh, let me cancel it. I, I know, but uh, I'm thinking about people there. Can you see if I write this way or you want... 20%. Uh, is <laughs> okay i'll try <laughs> so the other important point is computing the correlation correlation at the uh, so 20 percent you said it's okay okay this is uh, just a symbol and the meaning of this symbol is uh, one over z sum over the configurations s i s j e to minus h okay this is just the definition I mean this can be computed and this can be this expression here can can be written in terms of uh, this matrix t1 and the other one t2 and this can be assuming that j is equal to i this is an important point uh, which leads to the uh, time order the functions the correlation function in the case of the quantum model if uh, we assume that j is larger than i then you can easily check that this uh, expression here can be written in terms of matrices transfer matrices this way as a trace t1 i sigma z t j minus i i i mean i'm writing just in the case it uh, just in the case h is equal to zero to simplify the calculation but the calculation can be easily generalized okay and then here we have an another sigma z these are pauli this is the pauli matrix and here this one m to minus j okay i suggest uh, i suggest you to do this uh, calculation at least once okay then it's now we have written this in terms of trace and gain we can diagonalize this uh, uh, using the, the the diagonalization of the matrix t1 and uh, this can easily written okay the the size is uh, still this can be written as m to minus j plus i epsilon j minus i plus 
epsilon 2 m minus j plus i epsilon 1 over okay this is just a simple calculation okay you should also you should consider that uh, integral i is the one but sigma z is the this the, the is the diagonal Pauli matrix okay and you get this result this exact result no approximation okay so we have solved the problem the problem is very simple then if you will replace epsilon 1 epsilon 2 with their expression which is there amplified in the case h equal to 0 we have that epsilon 1 2 is uh, in one case uh, we have uh, cos um, cos h k and the other case should be sin h k okay okay just as exercise you can compute this this function here and uh, in particular <laughs> This can be easily done in the limit in the limit in which we send m to infinity you can check that this uh, the two point functions just given by tan h k j small okay so we have everything we have uh, the partition function we have the free energy and we know also the two-point function in this case everything is written in terms of sites mm? okay j label labels j and i label the the sites j minus i is the distance of the two spins in unity of the lattice spacing okay now, if you want to come understand the scaling limit, we need to introduce the all the uh, we need to introduce the, the real scaling. We need to measure them in terms of uh, meters, if you want, instead of lattice spacing. So we need to put back the length scale a, which is the lattice spacing. Okay. So let me define. Let me go back to the model. This is the model. In our model, uh, we were labeling the sites in terms i a j, okay, the screen, the screen number. Then we have a lattice spacing. So we introduce the length, the distance in terms of uh, in unity, standard unity. And the distance, for example, is x j minus i this is very simple okay this distance then we can write down instead of writing si mm, labeling the spin in terms of uh, the site we can write it in terms of a continuum variable which is tau or which is x uh, let me call it tau which uh, is better tau okay as tau okay no. we are changing variables in a way okay if we do that we can write down again the two point function in terms of these new scales As you can easily see, this is just an exponential behavior. So we can write it in this form. Minus tau over a correlation. Xi, where xi is obtained by this expression here. Xi is equal to A over It's just a simple derivation. 
okay? So we are rewriting the same thing, everything is exact in terms of this uh, new scale, which we put explicitly the lattice spacing. Okay? The idea the idea is that then we would like to take the limit a going to zero. But in order to do that, we need to keep the length constant, the physical length constant. Okay? So this is exciting. Let me note that when k goes to infinity, hmm, and this is an important point, uh, this correlation length is going to infinity. We have uh, that psi, and the limit k goes to infinity, this should go like 1 over 2 e to k. So we have a limit, okay, s which is k, which is a coupling going to zero, going to infinity, and this limit, the correlation length, which we, we call this psi, the correlation length, the physical correlation length, goes to infinity, and here I forgot an A. Okay? This is diverging in terms of A. Okay. Now we want to take the continuum limit. Let me also introduce the sides, the physical sides of uh, this uh, ring. Let me call it L, and the physical side is F times A. Okay? That's okay, now we can consider uh, the, the continuum limit, which is uh, in two different ways. One is saying, well, A is going to zero, while the physical length X over A is kept fixed. Okay, no, sorry, while xi is kept fixed. Okay, and the other point we can consider m going to infinity, keeping fixed l. Okay, so we keep fixed xi and l, and we send a to zero. Of course, this means that m must go to infinity. Okay? Yeah. All right, lattice spacing. I keep this fixed. Okay. Well, that's another point of view. Instead of taking A and going to zero, you can keep A fixed and consider the limit in which psi over a, l over a, goes to infinity. In a way, this is uh, the limit a to zero, which what will bring us to a quantum field theory, a continuum theory, okay? Usually, particle theories do that. I mean, you send the cutoff to infinity, and uh, you study your theory, keep it fixed this. I mean, uh, what I'm saying that this is equivalent. I mean, only when k goes to infinity, only when you are close to a to a critical point. Okay, so you can do this. You can uh, do this. You can send a to zero and keeping this fixed because in unity of uh, a, if a goes to zero, xi is fixed. It means that xi over a to infinity. Okay. So this means that uh, the continuum limit can only reach only when, when you approach this critical point, which is k equal to infinity in this simple model. Okay? This is a general fact. You have a quantum field theory. You define a quantum field theory for a statistical model only when you approach quantum field theory means a, t a theory defining the continuum. So you don't have a lattice spacing. Okay? At least we have a cutoff. And the cutoff, you want to send the cutoff. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to send the cutoff to infinity. Okay, you can define a continuum limit only if you approach a critical point. Uh, you need, uh, uh, but you you may consider this in these two different ways. 
Okay, this is just the point of view of condensed matter. Condensed matter, you say, well, you have a metal, you have a lattice, lattice spacing is whatever, okay? And I look at the system, the low energy properties of the system in the close to a particular point, which is a critical point. Otherwise, you can, so that's, that's totally equivalent. You can consider constant, okay, this quantity here, and send A to zero. Okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, uh, uh, in that case, you have a kind of finite scaling limit, but I would like to avoid it. I first send m to infinity and then send uh, k to infinity. Okay. Otherwise, I have a finite scaling, but I want to avoid this. Uh, okay. I'm considering that's the first limit. Let's say we are in thermodynamic limit. Mm? We may also consider them. Uh, I mean, a crossover. I mean. M, L, but uh, this can be done, but uh, just to avoid this uh, problem. Okay, now, the on in order to continue studying this uh, scaling limit, I have to consider also the, the, it's interesting to consider also the variable H, okay, which is the magnetic field. How to scale the magnetic field in order to define a continuum limit? That's uh, it's also important. Uh, we have defined the correlation length, we have defined the sides, Okay, uh, of the of the system, uh, and uh, we t we consider this continuum limit a to zero, keeping fixed this, for example. Okay, if you want to define a continuum limit in terms also of the magnetic field, we cannot keep h constant. Okay, the right rescaling of the magnetic field is uh, this one. Let me introduce a new variable, a rescaled magnetic field, which is H over A. In a sense, this is the average magnetic field over lattice spacing. Okay? Now the idea is to consider this model, okay? The model, the scaling, the scaling limit of the EC model, keeping studying the, the limit A to zero, keeping Xi, L, and U fixed. Okay? We will see what happens. This is cor cor should correspond to the con to the continuous scaling limit. If you have any question, since this is quite simple, I prefer that you follow all the calculations. Okay. So let me now define a, a scaling free energy. Free energy we can be defined in this way. One over m a. This is the density, the free energy density. One over m a. And here log z. Okay. Let's do the calculation. We have done the calculation. We have only we have to do what we have to do is to take the limit. A to zero, keep it fixed, the quantity we have mentioned before. Okay. You can do this calculation by yourself. It's very simple. We have all the quantities. You have to uh, write down epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 2 in terms of uh, xi, l, and u. Okay. Then send A to zero, taking only the first non-trivial term. Okay. If you do that, this is just an exercise, I leave it to you because uh, the blackboard is too s small to do this calculation. And uh, so, this is uh, what you should do replacing, uh, replacing epsilon 1, epsilon 2, we computed it before in terms of uh, H and um, H uh, and uh, um, Okay. Okay. If you do this calculation, keep only the non the first non trivial the, the, the leading order and the limit a and going to zero. Okay. Or if you want, since you want to keep constant xi, 
we need also it's equivalent to take xi to infinity and therefore k to infinity okay if you do this calculation with that we obtain let me write it uh, two cos h That's the result, where a0 is k over a, minus k over a. You see, there is a first term, okay, which is called an analytical term, okay, which will be relevant to discuss the scalar limit, okay, which is given by k over a. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there is another term here, which is the part we are interested in, which can be written in terms of L, L, Xi, and U. Of course, I missed L square, U square. Okay? So everything is written in terms of uh, scaling variables. Hmm? In particular, this which we call uh, the singular part of the, the scaling part of the free energy is a function is L to minus 1 times a function of L over Xi and L U. Are there questions? This, this are everything is exact for this model. I don't have to make any approximation. Here the only thing I did is the limit a to zero or k to infinity okay this is uh, something which uh, I don't understand well I don't know how to treat in the scaling limit but this is the analytical part in the critical phenomena this is always present but this is uh, gives contributions which are suppressed okay and this is the this is the function we obtained this function can be written in terms of uh, L to minus 1, okay, times the scaling function of L over Xi, or Xi, and L times U. Okay, actually, this can be generalized to more complicated systems, and the scaling free energy goes like 1 L to minus D, D is the dimension of the system, in our case, the dimension is 1, times the scaling function which depends, of course, on the dimension, depends on the universality class of the model. L over Xi, you see this is a dimensionless quantity, okay, and L times U. In the more complicated case, this is generalized, for example, this here, I should put an exponent, okay. But this is the scaling variable. The idea is that this scaling function here, the scaling function we obtain in this calculation, in this limit, is universal. Universal means it doesn't depend on the microscope and the macroscopic details of the model. Actually, you, you can do also the exercise, a little bit more complicated. Eh? Instead of considering uh, the simple model in which uh, okay, this is the model we consider with the just coupling, with a coupling between nearest neighbor lattice sites. You can also consider, for example, more complicated the model in which you add uh, K2 S I plus 2. Okay. You can change your Hamiltonian locally. Mm? And then uh, you can check, you can do the calculation. For example, in this case, uh, the transfer matrix would be a 4 by 4 matrix. matrix. You can analyze it. That's um, okay, us using mathematics as a simple exercise. You take the same limit. Okay, you define the correlation from the exponential decay or two-point function. You define the correlation, fu uh, correlation length. You have the sides. You take the same limit. You get the same function. Okay, you can check. This is universality. Yeah. Uh, 
th different dimension. Sorry. So you mean a different dimension, physical dimension? Well, on a fractal, uh, I, I'm not sure because it's, uh, it's uh, more complicated to define all these things. These things are very simple if you, we consider a simple, simple homogeneous system. On a fractal, it's a little bit more complicated. So, in principle, if uh, the, the, the system's um, regular, I mean, uh, you should change the dimension, uh, writing the defective dimension. But we, If this, if it, uh, well, uh, I don't know, you should do the calculation on the beta lattice. Uh, I, I, what I can say that uh, you can generalize all this uh, construction to any dimension, finite dimension D, for, um, I mean, a regular easy model on a regular lattice. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you uh, a good answer for this, uh, for the more complicated lattice sites. I never considered this. Uh, more complicated than lattice. Uh, this is just for cubic lattices, for example. I mean, uh, you generalize to the. Of course, the function is not the same. Okay, what I'm saying this is universal with respect to change of these couplings here. I mean, here we can, you, you can also put uh, another coupling and get the same result. Okay, I'm not saying that this function is the same in two dimensions depends on the measure. I'm not saying that this is uh, it's the same if you consider a com uh, spin more complicated spin model, for example, XY models and Eisenberg models and so on, with more components. Okay? In that case, the function is different, but the idea is, uh, the idea is similar. Okay? Uh, analogously, one can also write down the D2 point function in terms of the scaling variable, and one obtains I don't know if it's readable. E to minus tau or xi. See, here I'm considering the fact that the lattice is finite, okay? In this function here. Here there is minus L minus T over xi, okay? When you have periodic boundary condition, you have always this uh, farther term. If you send L to infinity, this cancel, okay? But you can write down. I mean, uh, that's the important point is here, the function as I, uh, I wrote you for, uh, can be written in terms of scaling or scaling behavior. So this means, for example, that you can write down a scaling behavior also, a general scaling behavior for a two-point function. And this can be written as, uh, um, as a, a scaling another function. For example, this way. If you do the calculation in the presence also of the magnetic field, you get a two-point function, a scaling behavior of this form. Here it's written only in this case without L times U. Uh, any question? If you cannot read what I wrote, what I write in the blackboard, you stop me. I'll rewrite. That's your right. Ah, 1 plus e to minus L over xi. In the limit L going to infinity, all these terms stop. Okay. The calculation is very simple. It can be, if you take, uh, I, in, uh, in I wrote you the, 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 the t in before I wrote the two-point function in the L to infinity limit, considering only in this term. This, in this case, I generalized the function, and this can be computed very easily. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's okay. It's for periodic boundary conditions, okay. 
you don't need anything else. That's what the scaling, the scaling limit is 2.5. If I, if I did the calculation correctly, you try and check. If it's wrong, let me know. Okay. But anyway, the important point is that the two-point function can be written in terms of scaling function, which is a function of these ratios, tau over xi, L over xi, and L times u. Okay? We have again the same scaling arguments of the free energy. Universality means that if you compute this two-point function in the case of a more complicated uh, easy model with two with uh, many couplings, local couplings, okay? Because it's also important that the theory is short range, the interaction between the spins is short ranged. Okay? But if you write down and compute it, you find the same scaling and you write the two point function in terms of the scaling variable, okay, you get the same result. Okay? The scaling function is uh, universal. Of course, here I'm neglecting terms which are order A. Okay. When you do this kind of asymptotic expansion, the scaling limit, you always have scaling correction. Okay. But they are subleading. Scaling is this. A limit A to 0, Xi, L, and U keep fixed. Or if you want, you, you keep fixed A and send Xi, L, and U to infinity. And, uh, and uh, well, yeah, and H to infinity. Yeah, no, it's not surprising because this is a simple model. Okay. If you instead consider an easy model in two dimension or three dimension, here, especially, well, not here, not here, but here in particular, you have the critical exponents. Okay. I mean, this uh, we will see next lecture that uh, you will get some non-trivial exponents when uh, you do blocking. This. Okay. This is uh, so. This is scaling limit. This is a universality concept. I mean. If you do the calc this calculation by yourself once, I mean, it's very simple. You understand the, the, the meaning of uh, these two concepts. Then this can be generalized. The, the importance of these two conce concepts is, is that they can be generalized to much more complicated systems where you don't know how to perform exact calculations. Okay? If I do, I mean, uh, if I study easy model in three dimensions, you don't know. You don't know the exact solution. Okay? But you can use uh, these ideas, and in particular, you can use the framework of normalization group theory, okay, to infer the scaling behavior. Then the idea is that if I compute this scaling function for just one model, the simplest model of some class of universality, the simplest one, I mean, doing numerical simulation, doing an experiment, for example, in in, uh, for easy model, you can do an experiment on uh, studying the liquid vapor transition. And you measure the two-point function, doing scattering experiments, neutron again against, against the um, neutrons against uh, the liquid, I mean, for example. I mean, and you measure the two-point function, okay, in the limit of uh, this limit, at the critical point, the same two-point function, when it's written in terms of scaling variables, should hold should hold also for um, magnetic models. Okay, so once you measure the scaling function for one model in the class universality class, you know, at this uh, second check, it's an exact prediction. You know that the same scaling function should hold also for other more complicated models. So you don't know how to perform calculations. Okay, questions? Now, let me continue. Now, next, next important point is the quantum, to the classical to quantum map. I want to show you that this model here is equivalent to a quantum model. And uh, I want to show you that uh, I can compute this scaling function from the quantum model because they are exactly related in the scaling field, in the scaling limit.
So the point is the following. Let me go back to the transfer matrix. Okay, I used to solve this model. I've, uh, this was defined this way. Okay, this matrix here. Huh? Let me write it in this form. As uh, uh, let me consider the scale in the well, I don't need the scale and limit. This can be written. Uh, oh, <laughs> let me do. This can be written this for a to the e to the k, 1 plus 2 a over psi sigma x, OK? Where x, where xi, sorry, is uh, 1 over 2 e to minus k, 2k plus, OK? You can uh, easily check that this is in the, in the, in the limit a to 0, and the k in limit k to infinity, this is uh, the first step, OK? Here I introduce them an operator, which is sigma. So this can be also written in this form here. You can check by doing uh, expansion, for example to first order in A. Okay? Then let me do another <laughs> analogous thing in, in terms for the two point for the the other matrix T two and this can be written as uh, E to A U sigma Z. Then uh, let me use uh, this uh, uh, general relation okay, which is standard. A is a matrix, A1, A2 for any matrix, for any matrices. And then we write down T1, T2, the product of the two matrix, of the two matrices, as uh, E to minus A. Let me introduce an operator, HQ, where HQ is equal to E0, which is a constant, relevant for us minus let me introduce this parameter okay that's a simple exercise i multiply and i'm using this uh, relation here of course i'm neglecting order i order terms in a and then i get this okay then I want to write the partition function. The partition function was uh, chase T1, T2 to M. Okay. And this uh, becomes chase E2 minus M H AQ. HQ. Okay, then let me call this. Now, if you check this delta here, it's just 1 over x xi, okay? While this u is the u defined before. Okay, then let me write this in this form. Y 
where introduce a temperature T 1 over L which is 1 over M A okay and here to order A I'm doing exact calculations there's another approximation at all see this HQ can be considered as a quantum Hamiltonian for a one spin model in the presence of a longitudinal and transfer field, magnetic field. But we have uh, just one spin, okay? That's a very simple model, one spin. And this uh, is just the partition function, the quantum partition function for a quantum model, in which we have a temperature now, and the temperature is just given by 1 over L, the inverse of the sides of the classical model. Okay. For this simple model, this is the classical to quantum mapping. You see, in the scaling limit, in the limit a to zero, because of course I have neglected order a square. So when we go, when we send k to infinity and we can neglect a, a is small with respect to the correlation length, then we get a quantum model. Okay. I suggest you to do redo all these calculations. They are simple. I mean, in this case, they can be done in a half an hour. Okay? So, this means that if, if I compute the thermodynamics of this quantum model, I, mean, I get the thermodynamics of the classical model. Okay? This quantum model has zero dimension, which is one side. This classical model has one dimension. So, one more dimension. So the quantum to classical model is a mapping which can be generalized. This is a mapping between a D plus one classical model and a D dimensional quantum model. Okay. In a way, the quantum mechanics is one more dimension. And this one more dimension, okay, is Euclidean eh, in the case of thermodynamics, but we can also perform a and uh, we can perform uh, an analytical continuation of this calculation and go to the real time. Okay. And so that the quantum mechanics of one spin is in a sense equivalent in the scaling limit and only in the scaling limit to a classical model. So, yeah. Well, uh, the mapping is always in a model which has one more dim spatial dim special dimension, classical special dimension. The point is that uh, we can have a dynamic exponent z which is different from one. So in that case, means that the model uh, is a, the classical model is anisotropic. But this is a, I will come back to this point later. Okay. The mapping, in general, the mapping is uh, from a d-dimensional, d-dimensional quantum model to a t plus one dimension classical Euclidean model. The point is that this dimension could be different from the other one. In some case, this dimension is in a sense equivalent to the other ones. We get, for example, uh, um, uh, farther symmetry, which is O d plus one, which is a Lorentz symmetry. We get. Uh, and then we can get, for example, we can study you know, CFT and so on. Okay, that's a particular case. Now, let me interpret a little bit the, the quantities that we have introduced in this quantum model. We have seen, we have introduced a parameter here delta, okay? This delta from the calculation is equal to 1 over xi, which is the correlation length of uh, the classical model. What's delta? If you diagonalize the model, you see that delta is the difference between the eigenvalues of, uh, the two eigenvalues of the, the system. I mean, this is the gap. Okay? So we have a general, general relation, which is that the gap of the quantum theory, 
which goes to zero when k goes to infinity, at the critical point we have defined, goes to zero because xi is going to infinity, goes like one of xi of the Euclidean model, of the classical model. Okay? And this is the gap. Okay? At least this is the gap when u is equal to zero at the critical point. Okay? Now it's matter of language. I mean, the two models are equivalent. Okay? If you want to read them from the quantum model, you interpret them, you talk about gap, you talk about temperature, T. Okay? If you instead want to talk about the classical model, you talk about correlation length, okay, along this uh, direction, further direction, and you talk about sides, L. Okay, the other important point is that are the correlation functions. I mean, this is the partition function. The partition functions are equivalent, are the same. They can be computed in one or the other model. They give the same result. But you may also, uh, actually, uh, one more thing I should say. Which this is important, let me cancel this. Let me consider the quantum model. Let me compute the the partition function. You should check it. This partition function can be easily computed because you can then analyze the matrix. What you get, you get, if you do the calculation, that's very simple, two by two matrix. Get, uh, if you define the, the free energy, uh, the free energy should be defined as usual, minus t log z, okay? You do the calculation and you get this e0 minus t log 2 cos n h Okay, this is the result you get. Very simple. In this case, the calculation is much simpler. And this, if you if you recall that t is one over l, and delta is one over xi, it's the same result we found before. Yeah. Okay. Must be the same. If I make a mistake writing or something. Uh, Okay, so this means that the scaling theory of the classical uh, si of the classical system is realized by the the simple Hamiltonian, the simple quantum Hamiltonian realizes the scaling b limit of the classical model. Okay, now the other point important point is what is are the correlation function. What we we must define the correlation function in the quantum model. Okay, let me define the time ordered correlation function. Yeah? No, the temperature is T. It's T is T is one over L. The classical model thermodynamic limit when L goes to infinity corresponds to T going to zero. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. It's otherwise. That's a very general. No, no, no. This is the temperature of the quantum model. The this is the temperature of the scaling model. Then, then we will see in the if we generalize this model to more dimension and we consider, for example, the easing chain, in that case we will see that there are values of these quantities of the couplings in which we have a quantum transition. But this is a different issue. 
Okay? That's very general. The, the quantum to classical mapping maps the temperature of the quantum model into a sides of the classical model. Okay? So if you want to get the t to zero infinity of the quantum model, you need to send L to infinity of the classical model. That's the same. Okay, let me consider the time order correlator. Okay, uh, I think that, uh, okay, let me finish this two minutes and then uh, uh, we will do a break. So, this is, uh, let me define this, uh, uh, assuming tau uh, one larger than tau two, we write this, we write this as a one over z trace e to minus hq t sigma tau one sigma z tau 2 okay if tau 1 tau 2 is larger than tau 1 we need to invert these two uh, objects okay this is the time ordered in the euclidean time the time order correlation function then <laughs> ah well i should define this because this is defined this way Okay. Define this way. This is a definition of the corre uh, correlation function. Then you can check, easily check, and I leave this as uh, exercise that this in the scaling limit, this correlator here is just given by the so the scaling limit of of the classical model you can check do the mapping that uh, they are the same so also the correlation there is a correspondence also in terms of correlation functions and this correspondence must be considered when we keep time order functions the reason why this must be a time ordered function is essentially related to the fact that when we defined we computed the the, the classical uh, two point function we assumed that one of the two points is on the right and the other one is on the left okay that's related to that point okay i think that we can stop here if you have questions i'm here Okay, let's start. Now, we have seen how to map classical model into a quantum model, okay? Now we do the reverse. I mean, we sketch the demonstration for the quantum to classical mapping. So we have to start from the quantum model, and the quantum model we are considering is just uh, the single spin. Uh, Okay, well, we call it, let me call it, you, okay, this is single spin, okay, we want to do quantum mechanics with single spin, okay, in particular, we want to compute the probability, let's define it, the probability Once we know that uh, at the time t i, the initial time, the configuration is s i, as an value s i, we measure s i, we want to know the probability, we want to compute the probability to get s f at the time t f. Okay, we are 
this is real time okay this is quantum mechanics okay you know uh, i think that you have already seen that you can do that using the formalism of the path integral path integral means that uh, you divide i mean discretize the the time okay introduce uh, a length small length a discretize the time and you write down this as a um well y you introduce intermediate intermediate configurations here okay you write down anyway you write this as uh, some product e 1 2 some n s plus 1 something like this okay I, i'm just catching the demonstration i mean uh, you can check it yourself you can do your calculation by yourself so assume that we start from the quantum model we want to do quantum mechanics okay the one of the fundamental objects you want to compute is this one this pro this is the amplitude and then you get the probability by taking the square of this quantity right then what you do you discretize and write this okay as a then this can be written as a function i mean let me this can be written this magic element okay which you repeat which is repeated for each couple of sites okay here can be written in this form very general because uh, this is a well-defined quantity and then you write down this as a sum over the intermediate configuration of a sum e from 0 to n minus 1 of this function defined before okay and this is called path integral okay this is the simple version of the path integral for this simple model okay this will define you can compute it how to compute it when you do part integral generally you define it in the euclidean space i mean you do a c an analytic continuation into the um, euclidean time so you change variable you go from t to tau okay introduce a euclidean time and uh, instead of computing this in the real time you compute the same quantity okay in the euclidean time which is defined in the same way the only difference that here instead of having i a phase here you have an exponential okay because the time is uh, euclidean Okay, you can repeat the exercise. Mm? Instead of uh, considering a phase here, here you put e to minus a h. Okay, you do the calculation. H, you know h, h is the Hamiltonian. You can do the calculation of this stuff. And you get something like this. Sum over s i of an intermediate configuration, which is the it's uh, in the kind of in the case of the path integral this is an integral uh, okay and e to minus a uh, sorry a quantity let me call h cla uh, classical h and this classical h well let me say this differently you have a sum here of a functional in the Euclidean space okay then if you do the calculation and and this I leave you I leave uh, this as exercise because it's very simple you need to consider this simple Hamiltonian try to do this calculation the limit a goes to zero 
Okay, what you get? You get some S A H classical, and this H classical suggests the Hamiltonian of the EC model. Okay, so I don't repeat the calculation because it's uh, it's analogous to the calculation we did before. Okay. The idea is the following. Let me repeat it. We st at the beginning, the first hour, we started from the classical configuration and showed you that this can be interpreted in terms of uh, a quantum model. I mean, the partition function in quantum model. Here, we start from the qu quantum model. Okay? You want to compute, for example, the partition function. Okay. You want to analyze the, the behavior of the dependence of the thermodynamic quantity on the, on the temperature. Okay, we can do the same. We can consider the Euclidean time. In this case, we arrive at partition function we already computed in the case of the classical Hamiltonian. Okay. The quantum mechanics is just obtained by taking the analytic prolongation, continuation of the results for the Euclidean space. Okay, so the quantum to classical mappings works in the two sides as a general fact. Okay, okay, uh, calculations is very easy. In order to, uh, to check if you understood what uh, we did before, you can uh, do the calculation here from scratch and uh, check that the the functional here you get is just the classical Hamiltonian, which is the sum over the sites hmm, along the Euclidean time. Okay, that's equivalent. Of course, everything is done in the limit a going to zero because in this case, okay, when you do, when you try to get uh, the path integral formulation of your quantum model. Here you need to get to take the limit a going to zero. Otherwise, uh, that's not well defined. That's not uh, there is not any physical meaning in the quantum model. Okay, that's uh, that's, that's essentially the 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 quantum to classical mapping. And this quantum class, this idea of quantum classical mapping will be exported to other more complicated models. And uh, and uh, and the conditions of this uh, quantum to classical mappings, which allows us to, to study um, to study a quantum model by studying a classical model in a different dimension. For example, let me give you an important example. If you have, uh, if you consider the strong interactions, QCD, I mean, the best theory, the, the most robust theory, I mean, the most fundamental theory of uh, uh, QCD is uh, defined in terms of uh, critical limit of in uh, critical limit of a statistical models in one more dimensions. And uh, is if you define your if you define your uh, a statistical model uh, uh, in a considering an, an Euclidean dimension, a further Euclidean dimension, and the sides of this Euclidean dimension is cell, then when you compute the partition function of the statistical model in the, in the critical limit, in the, in the scaling limit, you are computing in the partition function of the quantum model, which is QCD, which is the theory of trunk interactions, at the temperature T, which is equal to 1 over L. Okay? So this is the general fact. Okay? Uh, let me also see that this is a simple case. Sometimes when you have, uh, when you consider a quantum model, uh, the the theory, the action of the corresponding classical model could be also complex. Berry phase and some other complications. This is the simple version of the quantum to classical mapping. Okay. In this simple version, you uh, you can interpret physically not only the quantum model but also the corresponding classical model. Okay. Let me stress again that this can be done only in the scaling limit. So, in order to define a quantum a quantum field theory for uh, for a system, 
we need to go to, I mean, uh, to the critical limit. We need a correlation entity which diverges, which corresponds to A in goes to zero. Indeed, when you perform, uh, people uh, doing simulations for QCD, they go to this limit, which is called the continuum limit, and which is the limit in which the correlation length measured in terms of the lattice spacing goes to infinity. Okay? And in that limit, you realize the continuum theory, which can be checked when you do, I mean, experiments uh, with uh, protons, neutrons, quarks, whatever. Okay? So, uh, can you repeat? Yeah, th that's the concept of universality. I mean, the, the fact that you can uh, describe a quantum, a model, a system, the behavior system using a quantum field theory, okay, since a quantum field theory you, you put there only a few ingredients, I mean, only a few couplings, the idea uh, is that there is a large universality. I mean, quantum field theory is effective, works, because there is a large universality that goes together. Yeah, in fact, when you let me again stress the, the example of the QCD. When you simulate QCD, okay, you consider the statistical model corresponding to QCD. QCD is unique, of course. It's a quantum field theory. But you can construct an infinite number of statistical models which have the same continuum limit. Actually, you exploit this fact because uh, you, sh you choose the best one, the simplest one where you can perform more easily the calculation. And, and that's uh, the same with the easy model. If you have a liquid vapor transition, I mean, it's liquid vapor is complicated. There are molecules, <laughs> there are interactions. But I went to compute the critical indices of the liquid vapor transition. What I consider? I consider the lattice gas model. Lattice gas model is equivalent to the Ising model. I do the calculation for the Ising model. Then I know that uh, the universal feature, the scaling functions, the universal features are the same. Exactly the same. Okay? That's the idea. Critical limit means that uh, you are approaching a point in which the correlation length is diverging. Critical phenomena, critical. In general, not. In fact, when it's not diverging, you cannot describe it using uh, <laughs> quantum field theory. Yeah, if you have, uh, I mean, if you are far from the critical point, you have a metal a lot. I mean, uh, any continuous transition which realizes a continuous limit in this sense, because you have a divergent correlation length, corresponds, I mean, apart from exceptions, to a quantum field theory. So, in order to define a quantum field theory, okay, you can use this fact. You define it from the statistical, from the critical limit of uh, a theory. This is quite general, I mean. Then we can study the exceptions, but uh, I mean, this is a, can be extended to any dimension, for example, in the case of the easy model. All models I showed you, my first lecture, I, pres I showed you a number of, um, of model examples which describe critical phenomena. Writing down the Landau, Gisbol, Wilson, Hamiltonians, or Landau, Gisbol, Wilson, Lagrangians, which is written in terms of a few terms, quartic terms, okay? That Lagrangian contains the ingredients, I mean, the main, the main feature, the universal features of the critical behavior. Okay, but only when you go to the critical point. Okay, otherwise, you don't have this correspondence. Now, that's important point. And this is the same. If I, I can map the classical, lim the classical model to the, to the quantum model only when I send A to zero. That's a condition. Otherwise, the two models are different. There's tiny mapping. Okay? A to zero means A to zero may mean that you fix xi and send A to zero, or you fix A and send xi to infinity. From a statistical point of view, you are looking at a critical phenomena, which you interpret in this form here. Lattice spacing is fixed, okay? If you look at the magnetic transition on a lattice, and the lattice is a metal, I mean, you cannot change the lattice spacing. You can only, by tuning the temperature, you can change the correlation length. 
Okay. The point is that the relevant variable is psi over a. So you send a to zero. Uh, you can take psi to infinity or a to zero. This quantity goes to infinity. That's the point. Otherwise, you cannot reach this continuum limit. Okay. Of course, when I I'm considering the I'm, I'm considering the critical modes. In this case, I mean, the critical modes are uh, also the are also constructed in terms of uh, the main variables I introduced in the, in the Hamiltonian. Sometimes they are not the variable you introduce in the Hamiltonian. I mean, there are other critical modes you need to recognize them. And it could be more complicated. Yeah. In the mapping, uh, so one is in the limit of uh, uh, k going to infinity, diverging length. I have uh, the mappings from classical to to quantum. The, uh, do you remember the 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 the, the gap is uh, in the quantum corresponding quantum model was delta, which is one over psi. So this is very small. So I'm close to a quantum. When I do the other transformation, I start from here. Well, it depends on, on depends on what you do. I mean, this J could be considered small anyway. Mm -hmm. The important point when you start from a quantum model, okay, this is for any J and U. The important model, eh, you construct this quantity here, and uh, you construct the corresponding path integral, is that the path integral is defined in the limit a going to zero here. Then in the limit a going to zero, I can show you that this quantity here can be written in terms of an Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian. Of course, the classical Hamiltonian in the limit a going to zero. Okay? If you want to get information from this quantity here from there, you need to take the limit a going to zero. You cannot stay, you, you cannot take k, fac, uh, do the calculation for a fixed k and conclude that this calculation applies to the quantum model. You need to do the calculation for k going to infinity. Corresponding to psi goes to infinity. I mean, this is the, how the quantum to classical mapping works. This is the way, okay? For this reason, uh, since it's uh, not simple, and it's not this is not a simple idea, and this I, I, I recognize it, but this is a simple model. In order to understand uh, a complicated idea, a quite sophisticated idea, I suggest you to do the calculation for this simple model. Okay, and the calculation are simple. You don't need to do path integral, functional integration, whatever. That's, that's just uh, just a few matrices. I mean diagonalization limit okay but uh, in this way if you do this calculation you understand what what are the correct limit in order to get to go from the quantum to the classical to the from the cl or to from the classical to the quantum okay okay of course this, this solution here that can be found in the textbooks i mean uh, this uh, what i'm okay now last uh, uh, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. Last 15 minutes, let me generalize this uh, approach. Okay? Not to any model, but at least to any dimension. Okay? Let's go from D equal, uh, if the model is quantum model, if we consider the quantum model, we have zero dimension. If we consider the classical model, we have one dimension. Let's go to higher dimension and, and see what happens. But in that case, I cannot do the calculation exactly as I did for this model. Okay, I can show you the correspondence anyway.
So let me consider, for example, uh, one more dimension. Okay. Uh, so we take the now we have uh, the lattice more complicated. We have uh, a square lattice. We call this direction spatial direction. Let me call it x. x. Okay. The dimension along x, well, so whatever. We in particular we can consider a an infinite dimension here. Okay. Here we have other lattice sites along this direction. And let me call this other direction tau. Okay. So we can define, uh, for example, uh, an easy model on this, uh, on this, uh, uh, on this lattice, define it on this uh, lattice, and this is, for example, defined in this way. Where uh, here I take the sum over nearest neighbor. Okay, so I have a spin here, a sum over this, and this, 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 if you want. Okay. Okay. Actu actually, you can take the sum over the links. That's the easy model defined in two dimensions, for example. That's I also solved exactly. So there is a the Onsager solution for this model. Okay, and let me consider so L X and L tau. So again, if you want to do the same calculation as before in order to show that this classical model maps to a quantum model, I should compute the transfer matrix. Okay. Now, the transfer matrix about what? Transfer matrix from going to one slice to the other slice. Hmm? Okay. Now, as you can easily understand, this transfer matrix is much larger. It's not a, a two by two matrix, matrix, uh, matrix but that's an infinite in the size of symphony. So I, I don't know how to do the calculation exactly at this point here. Okay. But uh, on the basis of what we have seen for the zero dimensional model, let's try to mm, hint a correspondence between this and a quantum model. Okay. Now there is there are couplings uh, from this slice to this other slice along the time. Okay. So this coupling here along the time this one time okay understand do you understand what i mean i mean let's this term here okay correspond in a way to the term we found that we we already had before you remember in zero in one dimension we had s uh, s i s i plus one okay and this is the equivalent. Oh, the only difference is that here we have uh, slices. Okay? This okay, can be also shown better, but I don't have time. This should go to what we found before, more or less. A transverse term. We call the x, uh, I don't remember the term, e x. Okay? On the other end, all the terms which he leaves here on the slice as a fixed time, okay, they should go, uh, space, they should go to some kind of sum over j, sum over the space, special links, k, j, sigma, I sig sigma j z okay so I'm trying to hint the quantum model corresponding to a two-dimensional classical easy model let me repeat the terms coupling uh, the terms coupling one slice to the other slice should be equivalent to the term we found before and this can be translated in terms of uh, a single spin, uh, uh, Pauli matrix. I mean, a term which should describe, in a sense, an external, an external transfer field in the quantum model. All other terms within the, the slices at fixed time okay, should correspond to couplings between the spins. 
the quantum spins. Indeed, in the scaling limit can be proved that this model here is equivalent to the easing chain in the transfer field, which is, uh, so this model in the scaling limit, okay, corresponds to a, the quantum easing chain, which can be, whose Hamiltonian is written this way. Now, this is defined uh, on uh, a line, it's a chain, okay? And these are operators, okay? This model is defined on the square, okay? And these are number. Okay? The idea is that in the scaling limit, the partition function of the classical model, which is written this way, let's assume we here you can put also beta. Be careful that the, what I call beta here, and that's the reason I put beta and not one over t, has nothing to do with the temperature of the quantum model. Okay? Should go in the scaling limit, okay, assuming that uh, there is a scaling limit in this case, and we'll see where is the scaling limit, should go to the, to the partition function of the quantum model. But now, the temperature here, okay, we generalize the result we found before, the temperature is the inverse of this uh, sites. Okay? And this is the version of the quantum to classical mapping in one more dimension. Okay? Now, of course, I have to show you, I have to convince you that uh, there is a scaling limit. Okay? In the case of the zero-dimensional quantum model and the one-dimensional classical model, the scaling limit was k going to infinity. Okay? In this case, it won't be this way. The scaling limit will be different. Well, Lx could be taken to infinity. That's the spatial dimension. Lx goes to Lx here. I mean, to the dimension of the quantum model. This is the Euclidean time. You may consider it as an Euclidean time. Actually, in this case, uh, the model is isotropic. Okay, in the case of the easy model. So you can choose any direction. One of them, okay, is finite here. If you choose that this is the time direction, the Euclidean time direction is finite. One over this corresponds to the temperature of this model. Okay, this is the correspondence. Okay. And this correspondence is exact on the limit A going to zero, on the critical limit. Okay. This is the physical length. This is physical length. The lattice spacing is A. This is measured, this is the physical length scale. Then, I, then of course, the scaling you should have, should compute, you should define a correlation length, and the scaling is defined taking fixed xi over L tau uh, and so on. Lx could be taken the, uh, anyway. I mean, that's it. So, let me finish mentioning, yeah? Well, in this case, uh, in this case, essentially isotropic model. But anyway, it should be along this direction. Strictly speaking, it should be along this direction. In the case of easy model, easy model is isotropic. You cannot, dis you don't distinguish it. Uh, dis it. Now we have to send, we have to find the critical mode. You have to go to the critical mode. The critical, uh, the critical uh, point is the critical point of the two-dimensional easy model. We know that it happens at some p value of beta. Well, uh, yeah, in general, like what, when, when, you, 
when you have a classical model, the correlation length diverges in any direction. The, the only point is that it could be that uh, the power law of the divergence along one direction is different to the other one. This is th they are called anisotropic models. They are, they are models with the dynamic exponent z different from one. But the, the, the all critical phenomena, which can be described, for example, by standard CFT theory, okay, you assume an, a, a, a symmetry for for rotation. It's equivalent to a Lorentz symmetry. Okay. Yeah. No, this 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 is this. I want to construct the correspondence between classical and quantum model, and I define it in this way. Ta I'm try I'm trying to give you an idea. This is not derivation. On the basis of what we have done in zero dimension, in zero dimension we have only one Euclidean time direction. We don't have special direction. Okay, the coupling along the time that this Euclidean time direction should correspond. I mean, uh, the idea is if uh, the calculation is analogous, in a sense, should correspond to a transfer field in the in the quantum model. Okay, by analogy. I mean, I, I'm trying to to I'm not de deriving this result. Okay, and uh, what happens instead along the other direction should go to a term which describes interactions along the spatial dimension. So we have a one dimensional sp uh, one dimensional quantum model, and here we have one plus one classical model okay now if we the idea is that if we study the critical behavior of this I mean so we study this theory okay okay we can also have information on this theory actually the critical behavior the quantum critical behavior of that theory and the classical critical behavior of this theory is equivalent it's the same universality class okay um actually i i think that i will stop here and then i will continue next uh, next time if you have questions since the time is running i mean it's uh, five minutes they are not sufficient if you have questions so just uh, to summarize what we have uh, done today, what I meant to, to what's the message of all these calculations, simple calculations. I mean, as I said before, showing you that the meaning, the concept of scaling limit. Okay? Scaling limit to a point in which the correction length is diverging. This is a critical behavior, I call it. I mean, we are talking about critical phenomena. Okay, this is the first point. The point associated with the scaling limit is the concept of universality, the idea of universality. Okay? Universality means that you can change the details of your model. Okay? But if you leave some global properties, and uh, you don't change some global properties, for example, the symmetry of the model, the range of the interactions, uh, the, the, the spatial dimensions, and so on, you get the same scaling functions. The limit, the asymptotic limit, when you approach the critical point, is the same. If you, def of course, if you write it in terms of scaling quantities, which are the correlation length, the physical size, and so on. Okay, this is important. Sec the other important point is that there is a, a mapping, I mean, a general mapping, I mean, at least for this simple model, between quantum models and classical models. Okay, you have to add one more dimension. But if you have this mapping. Okay, and you will get information for the quantum critical behavior, the quantum critical behavior at zero temperature of the quantum model. Okay, you can study the corresponding classical model. Okay, if you want to get information on the asymptotic behavior of the Ising chain, okay, you can use the scaling function. You know the already the exact results because you can use the scaling function of the two-dimensional Ising model, which is exactly known. Okay. Instead, if you have uh, information on the quantum model, because it's easier to get information from the quantum model, okay, you can use the information, the critical information of the quantum model, to get information for the classical model. Okay? And this is the main reason why 
many things which can be studied, which are studied at quantum transitions in d-dimensional quantum models can be already obtained from the theories used from the quantum field theories used to describe critical phenomena at thermal transitions. Okay? So, in order to describe the easing chain, for example, the, the, the quantum easing model in two dimensions, and to study the quantum transition of the two-dimensional quantum model, you can use the results already obtained for the three-dimensional classical models. You can use the same critical exponents. Okay? And their arguments, the physical arguments, which are at the basis of this uh, correspondence, are the quantum to classical mappings, are essentially what I showed you here. Of course, then when you make, the, uh, make things more complicated, you should be careful because uh, when you work with a classical model, you are working with the Euclidean time. And if you do uh, approximate calculation uh, along the Euclidean time, you don't get easily information for the real time evolution because the, the, continu the analytical continuation is uh, critical in this case. Okay. But this is uh, a problem of analytical continuation. If you know exact results for the two-dimensional classical model, you can get exact results by continuation, uh, analytic continuation for the one-dimensional. Okay. If you know the spectrum of the easing chain, I mean, someone, someone here computed it, you get information for, for some the of the of the features of the two-dimensional classical models, okay? Okay. <laughs>